Production funding for Sports Files is made possible in part by... Infinity of Memphis has moved to Germantown Road just half mile north of Wolf Chase Galleria and is proud to support WKNO for its quality broadcasting and service to our community. Quality and service? No wonder Infinity of Memphis feels at home on WKNO. The WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Today on Sports Files, we look back at a very disappointing season for the Memphis Tigers basketball team and look ahead to the Tigers' future. And we'll do so with a panel of local sports writers and sports casters who have followed the Tigers all season long. Normally when you mention Memphis Tigers basketball, it elicits a favorable response. Tigers round ball has been part of the Memphis community for decades, and with it has come much joy and fond memories. But this season was different, much different. In fact, it was a season most fans of the program soon rather forget. The Tigers battled chemistry issues, injuries, transfers, and for a good portion of the season, plain old bad basketball. And according to head coach Josh Pastor, it may as well toss in some bad luck. The end result was an 18 and 14 campaign, the worst under Pastner, in fact, the worst in many a year. For the first time since the 1999-2000 season, the Tigers were absent from postseason play. Six of their defeats came on their home court, including a loss at the hands of Tulane and a road defeat at East Carolina, two perennial punching bags on the Tigers' schedule. Crowds were down drastically, and the concern now is that season ticket sales for next year will suffer. So can we chalk it up to one rotten season, or is it the start of a downward trend? Are there some serious issues and concerns? Today we look at the future of the Tigers while observing the past and break down the much maligned head coach of the Tigers whose detractors are apparently outnumbering his supporters, this despite four NCAA tournament appearances in six seasons. And to help me break this all down today is the Tigers beat writer for the commercial appeal, Jason Smith, co-host of the Midday Show on Real Sports Talk, Sports 56 and 87.7 FM, Eli Savoy, and Grant Milner, the lead writer for GoTigers247.com. And it's all next on Sports Files. <music> Guys, thank you so much. Appreciate your time. Jason, let me start with you. What the heck happened this season? A lot of underachieving. And I think it was players, I think it was coaches, and, uh, you know, it didn't help them that Aki Collins was gone for the season. I, I think, you know, he's one of their strongest coaches, disciplinarians, t uh, tacticians. That didn't help. There was bad luck with, with Austin Nichols going down. But um, other than that, I think it was a lot of, uh, you know, expectations that didn't get fulfilled. I think this team should have been better than it was. Grant, we heard a lot of, I don't know if you want to call them excuses, but a lot of reasons for the struggles. Obviously, a lot of guys trying to gel. There were transfers. Obviously, there was some bad luck, too, if you listen to Josh Pastner. But are these reasons legitimate for what we saw on the court? No, I, th I think their youth was probably the, the biggest reason why they struggled. I, I thought they didn't define roles soon enough either. I, I thought that Josh playing a 10-man rotation in February was probably not the greatest decision. Uh, I think guys like Shaq Goodwin, at least until Austin Nichols went out, didn't exactly know where he stood. You know, we, we talked about him being the guy back in the summer. And then all of a sudden, all we talked about was Austin Nichols. And so I think he struggled until he went out of the lineup. And then until they got to that seven-man rotation at the end of the year, they really weren't playing their best basketball. Eli, there have been disappointments in years past under Josh Pastor, but this year is the first time I can remember with fans just tuning out completely with a month or so to go in the season. Do you believe that's all because of just this year simply, or is this an indictment of maybe the six years with Josh at the helm? I think it's a little bit the pattern kind of of underachieving, maybe people not getting to the Sweet 16, some of the better teams that he had. But a lot of it's this year when you start losing to Tulane on your home floor, Stephen F. Austin on your home floor, uh, you lost the Christian Brothers game, even though it didn't technically count. I mean, that the, the fans got blown out when you had good teams come in. Fans didn't like going to see that, and I think that's where they tuned you out. Jason, what are you hearing from the fans? I know you get a lot of emails, texts, people calling you to want to get uh, their feelings expressed. What have they said? Oh, I, I can't find many that are happy. 
or, or that are satisfied with, 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 with what happened this year. Um, I, I do wonder if, you know, it's, it's obviously the fans that, that are unhappy that, that kind of are the loudest. They'll be the ones on Twitter. I wonder, you know, how much of the fan base now is, 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 is anti-Josh. Um, it looks like a ton when you, when you read Twitter and you yeah. look the media, that kind of thing. Um, I think there are some that are still with him, um, but he's got to – He's got to get to a he's got to get to a Sweet 16. I think even he knows that. Uh, at least by you know now that we're going into year seven, it looks like with Josh. Grant, the crowds were dwindling. They announced one thing, but we saw with our own eyes how small those crowds were. Ticket sales for next year. That's going to be an iffy proposition mm -hmm. for the University of Memphis. With that said, how hard is it going to be to convince the fans that this was just one bad year? Let's move on, and things will change next year. I don't think it'll be incredibly tough, even though Nick, Nick King and Pookie Powell are gone. You still have enough talent coming back, at least, to be able to say, hey, look, we got Austin Nichols, we got Shaq Goodwin. We've got talent across the board with the Lawsons coming in as well to put out an exciting product next season. Now, I think Josh sold the fact that they had high numbers of ticket sales at the beginning of the year, and that kind of depleted as the year went along. So that wasn't quite on his side by the end. But I mean, I, I know most people that if you're going to buy season tickets, this might be the time to do it. They're probably going to be the cheapest they've been. And, you know, if you get in now, you know, it may pay off three, four years down the road. There is some talent on this team. There is some talent coming in. But, Eli, is there a bigger problem here that exists? Well, the big problem, I think, right now is regardless of the talent coming in, right now you still have a deficiency at the point guard position. Right. And, I mean, with departures, when you see the amount of guys de with the departures, I mean, there there is some signal of a problem. I mean, uh, this happens in college basketball now we, we a lot more than we've ever seen. Guys are transferring from every program. But this is a lot of guys leaving one program in the last year. I mean, that and that doesn't signify great things. Yeah, Jason, five top 100 yeah. players. Yeah. And, and we could break them all down. Sure. I don't want to do that. Yeah. But uh, the consensus is either that it's on the players or it's on the coach. Right. I mean, obviously, there's, there's a mixture, too. But who's more at fault? That's a great question, Greg. I, I think you have to put it with both. I, I do. I'm with Eli. You know, six players in the last eight months. Yeah, you could break them all down. And say, well, well, two of them were dismissed, and Dominic Woodson and, and, and Karan Iverson, but four of them left by choice. And I think the biggest problem for Josh is when you have a guy like Nick King, who obviously was a talent coming out of East High, a guy who wanted to be a Tiger all of his life, didn't take any other official visits. He doesn't succeed at Memphis. What does that say to the other Memphis recruits in town in terms of, oh, can I go there and succeed? Uh, Nick King couldn't do it. A guy who, by all accounts, is a role model. I mean, did everything the right way, unlike some of the other players, didn't embarrass Josh publicly during games when things weren't going well for him. If a guy like that can't succeed, a Memphis kid, how does Josh keep this recruiting base mm -hmm. that he's got? Grant, we heard so much about all these new guys and trying to to find some chemistry. And that was a big challenge for Josh and his coaching staff. But to be in that situation, to have all these guys that were new, to not have that point guard in waiting, although Josh thought it was going to be Pookie Pal, that's an indictment to some extent on the coaching staff. And we've heard that from some of the fans. So next year, you're talking about another bunch of new guys trying to mesh. Well, Some of that blame has to be on Josh, right? Yeah, I think so. Uh, you know, I, I don't think he did a good job planning beyond the four senior guards. Right. You know, I mean, you think back even to last summer, we didn't know about Keijan Johnson until August. So I mean, that roster could have consisted of Pookie Powell and Demonier Cunningham only. I mean, then what would the product have looked like down the stretch? You know, Keijan actually improved and, and played better and at times carried the team, specifically in the Connecticut game at home. Um, so it could have been much worse than it did, but I, I think the biggest thing Josh has got to do this offseason is find a point guard for the future. I thought maybe that was Pookie Powell. Obviously, it's not now. You know, Keijan Johnson can play that role next season, but I think you've got to find somebody that you can start to groom and get into that role for 2016, 2017, and beyond. I mean, you can't just keep playing this uh, transfer game, grad transfer type of deal. Otherwise, it's going to eventually come back to bite you, and it somewhat did this year. But we know the Lawsons are going to get playing time right off the bat. Obviously, they're being brought in to be saviors. I don't think that's, can, that's a tough label for them. You have another kid in, in Brody, right, coming in from Maryland. You're obviously going to have some other holes that need to be filled because of the, uh, the recent uh, uh, transfers from uh, King and Pookie. So you're starting to get some players adding up. If Nick Marshall reclassifies, 
they can't use that excuse again, can, uh, again well, can no, they? I mean, this is the whole thing. Josh, the, the one thing through this whole process and, and part of the reason that he got this job was that he was supposed to be such a great recruiter. Mm -hmm. Great recruiters shouldn't be relying on graduate transfers and junior college kids and shouldn't be left with a year right. where you don't have a point guard basically going into the season. That's not great recruiting. That's poor planning and poor execution. So, yes, he went and got the Lawsons. Uh, that's great. But as, asking them to be the saviors of a program mm -hmm. is a little unfair to them um, so we see what happens with them but again no point guard possibly we don't know what Kedron's dedication is going to be if you go out and get more transfers that's not great recruiting that's just patchwork and it's not it's already shown you're not going to be successful doing that the Tiger Nation certainly spoiled from John Calipari and what we went uh, what we were able to uh, celebrate during his tenure at Memphis mm -hmm. uh, big time games big time tournaments sure. going far obviously a national championship uh, that came up a little bit short Tough to follow in those shoes for, for uh, Josh. But with that said, what should the expectations be? And has Pastor met those expectations? Well, I think, obviously, it's, it's unfair to compare. We, we, we've pointed that out. It's unfair to compare Josh, who was 31 when he took the job, right. uh, to, to, the, to John and to those four years he had. I'm with you that I think the fan base has become somewhat spoiled by those four years. However, when you, to answer your question about expectations, this guy's had two top five classes, now a number nine class, and they haven't advanced past the first weekend of the tournament. So from that standpoint, you have to say he hasn't met expectations with the, with the way he's been able to recruit. Grant, what's the biggest mistake Josh has made? <sighs> so wow. far? Wow, that's tough. Um, Some would say development of the players. X's and what, what do you think it is? I, I don't think it's development of the players. I think his sta he's made errors in his staff. I think he should have hired somebody from the beginning that had head coaching experience that he could turn to and trusted on a daily basis. Um, I, I think that's definitely been a problem. Uh, I, I think maybe he's recruited a little bit too much in the city of Memphis. I mean, John Calipari didn't do that. I think it's tough for kids to come in with all those expectations. I think it's okay to dabble in there and get as many as you can, but I don't know if he should have gotten all of them. Eli, do you think a coaching change, I'm talking about on his staff, will be made? Uh, I would have to believe they're going to make some sort of change. Now, what impact that has, mm -hmm. I don't know. And who's who really wants to come work for him? You know, everybody wants to throw out, let's go get the veteran guy to help him out. But if from in the coaching world out there, I don't know how Josh is viewed by those guys and how secure he is here. If you think that Josh may only have one more year at Memphis, are you rushing to come work for him mm -hmm. and be out of a job in a year? So it, he's, I, I don't know how easy it's going to be to go hire some great candidate that might be out there as an assistant coach. Jason, this week his name had come up with the opening now at Arizona State, although the consensus is that it's Jeff Cable's job if he wants it. Mm -hmm. The fact that his name got out there a couple of national reporters put it out there, and it caught fire. Maybe there'll be uh, other opportunities out there with job openings, maybe at Alabama. What do you think if there is a legitimate offer on the table for Josh at a legitimate top five or top big five as, uh, as far as conferences are concerned program, does he leave? I think he certainly takes a strong look at it and probably and my guess is he would, especially if it was a Power Five conference, as you said. You know, that, that's, that's where everybody wants to be these days is in the Power Five conference. It's where the money flows. Obviously, for, from a facility standpoint, you're fine. Uh, you know you got the, the financial support to do pretty much whatever you want. So, yeah, if it came down to it, would he, would he leave if those, if those opportunities came? I, I think he would. I, th I, I think, and Josh has never said this to me directly, but I think he regrets not taking the USC job a couple of years ago. Um, I, you know, I, I think the, the, the scrutiny, uh, the criticism, I think it's worn on Josh. I really think it has. And, and to the point where if something, if the right spot came open, he'd be ready to go. Eli, Tom Bowen, the uh, Memphis AD, has come out and said that he supports Josh. He's his coach. Of course, there's news this week about Tom being a finalist for the Cal job, which is very mm -hmm. interesting. But if you were in Tom Bowen's shoes, how would you deal with the basketball program and Josh Pastner specifically, knowing that Tom was brought in here to resurrect the football program? Well, that's the thing is, is how much he really wants to get into changes and, and things of that nature when they're still kind of focused on football. But uh, I think you, you sit down with Josh, you talk to him about his staff, uh, changes you would like to see made. I think you have to look at some of the scheduling and talk to him about that and let him know that, you know, 
next year is a very important year which I, he already knows that he doesn't have to, to be told that but but you need to see progress and you need to you know a lot of these little discipline things i think mm -hmm. it's great for a coach to have discipline but all these little one game suspensions and stuff like that we got to figure out something so we can't keep having this going on game after game after game with all of these different kids I, there's a lot of different things i think little things within the program that need to be straightened out Grant, there are different levels of fans. There's the diehards. There's the fans that go on the road with the Tigers. There are marginal fans, lukewarm fans. I'm talking now about the marginal, lukewarm fans, but they do support Tiger basketball. How does Josh win them back over? I don't know if he can, honestly. I mean, at this point, I think a lot of people, and I'm not sure Twitter is the uh, best measurement <laughs> system for the overall <laughs> fan base based on the people that I've seen right. out there at least. But uh, I, I think there are a lot of people that just think he's not ever going to be John Calipari. That ship has sailed it's time to move on. And I'm not sure that's completely fair because there aren't a lot of people out there that are John Calipari. I mean, let's be honest. That's, he's a, a one-in-a-lifetime kind of coach at this program, at least. And um, so if he wins, I, I think winning cures all problems. Yeah. If Josh goes to the Sweet 16 next year, everybody's bought back in. I mean, you look at, like, even the UConn game this year when they go on the road and they win. I mean, it was like a completely different – fan base on Twitter and on our message boards and different things. And then the next week they lose and it's right back to square one. So mm -hmm. Josh wants to win the fan base back. Go make the Sweet 16 next year. Do any of you feel that if we have a season, anything close to what we just had, that Josh wouldn't be let go? Any of you think he'd be back for another year if they miss the NCAA tournament next year? I can't imagine that. I'm no, that completely job. with you. Even though there's a lot of money on the table that the school would owe him, I, I just don't see any way they bring him back if they don't make the tournament. I think next there year. are people in this town that are willing to pay that money if, if they fail next year. If they, I, I think one year people can say it's an anomaly and, and move on and just assume that they're going to get back on the right track next year, but two in a row be pretty difficult to stomach especially with the Lawson's coming in yeah that's yeah. the thing like this you always had this year was right. the selling up but the Lawson's are coming the Lawson's are coming mm -hmm. now it's who are you selling next year as the saviors of your program that when you miss a tournament again and they are really good the Lawson's are good I mean we've we've all watched yeah. them here but I think we would all agree that they're not saviors I mean, no not, not next year maybe in, maybe in two to three years but sure. definitely not next season well let's let's talk about next season let's talk about the addition of the Lawson's but Memphis has missed on some of these kids some of them local mm -hmm. some of them from out of state what type of team are we looking at? Go back to the point guard. You guys brought up the point guard situation. That's the key. If it's Kedron Johnson, and I don't know how hard he's going to work in the summer to get in shape and be ready to go, how much better can they be next year? I, I mean, I think it all comes down to that question. What, who's the point guard? Mm -hmm. And if it is Kedron Johnson, how committed is Kedron Johnson to being a really good basketball player, or is basketball just the thing to do on the side? Um, yeah, the Lawsons will be good. All right, gonna, like I said, they're not going to be saviors. If Shaq is back, and if you get the Shaq of the end of the year, if you get a healthy Austin Nichols playing the way he did, I mean, they still can be pretty good. It should certainly be an NCAA tournament team. But if you don't have a point guard play, you can't expect a whole lot out of them. Jason, what do you think about next year? I'm, I'm, I'm with Eli for the most part. As long as, as long as Shaq and Austin are back, you bring you add the Lawsons to that. Uh, Treshawn Burrell obviously was coming on toward the end of the season. The key is, like Eli said, is with, with the point guard position. Is Kedron committed? Is he going to come back like he started this year, o overweight and out of shape? Or is he going to come back as a guy who says, okay, I'm going to give it my all in my last year? If you get the Kedron Johnson that you got the last three, four games of the season, I think they'll be a pretty good team. Um, but if you get that guy that started the year that apparently that doesn't do anything in the offseason, you're, you're in trouble if you, don't, if you haven't gone out and gotten another point guard. Grant, is there a chance anybody else will leave? I mean, I think there's always a chance, and we saw Damian Wilson leave in August last year. Not that he was necessarily a, a, a key piece to that team. I mean, but it's definitely possible. Uh, but one thing I will say about this recruiting class is that the Lawsons are great, and they will fill holes on this roster, but they don't solve the biggest issue, and that's at point guard. And, you know, Randall Brody is not going to be a guy that comes in and starts from day one. I just don't believe that. And so unless you can get Kedron Johnson to buy in this summer and get back to being the player that he was at Vanderbilt for a stretch, uh, they're going to be in trouble next year because it, it doesn't matter how great your talent is in the front court if you have nobody that can get them the basketball. Let me go back to the social media deal. You see former players tweeting often, Chris Crawford, Jaron yeah. Johnson, seemingly all in support of Josh Pastner. Nick King, as we mentioned, is gone. Praise the coaching staff. Thank the fans. Are they just saying things to be nice, or do they legitimately have the faith in Josh 
And if they do, the players, the former players, the current players, why do we care what the fans think? Let me, Jason, let me go to you first. Well, uh, that's a great question. I mean, I, some of some of his former players have been pretty critical of him as well. I mean, I, I've seen Antonio Anderson, I've seen Wesley Witherspoon. So I think I think it's a little bit on on both sides. Um, Wasn't that more about the team, or was that about Josh? You might. I mean, you might. You probably have a point. It's probably a, a lot of Antonio's, especially, was about the team not playing hard. We wouldn't do this, that kind of thing. But um, you know, it it is funny that that. You look at who the guys are that are supporting Josh. Well, they're the guys that graduated early and stayed here. Um, but then you look again uh, uh, again today at a, a, a kid who left, Dominic McGee, and he's tweeting, okay, six guys have left this year. Mm -hmm. If that ain't a problem, then, then, then what is? So, but a guy who couldn't stick it out. He didn't right. even stay for, well, for the that's, start that's of the game. That's true. That's true. And that, I, I, probably pretty low of him to do that at this point looking back. But, um, no, I, I'm – it's hard to say. It's hard to say. I see both. I see both sides of it. Well, certainly. I mean, a guy like Jaron owes a lot to Josh. I mean, Jaron right. certainly he gave does. Second him chance. A second That's chance. Right. You know, somebody like Nick King. You, when you're looking to transfer, you can't bash your coach. I mean, you, that just turns other coaches off to you. So Nick King is not in a position to say anything bad about him right now. Nick King needs to praise this. He wants to show other coaches that he and, and just right. that's, that's the way Nick King is it's too. Just the way he about. is. He's exactly. not going to be a guy that bashes him, whether he likes him or dislikes him. I don't, you're not going to hear that negative stuff out of him. So I mean, I don't know what you take out of uh, out of all of that stuff, but I think a lot of it is guys are, are normally when you had that opportunity, um, you're, especially if you're still trying to play basketball yeah. somewhere. You don't like to go. People like to see a bash right, former right. coaches. But with the Memphis kids, where you hear the negativity usually comes from the inner circle. That's true. Uh, but I think you look back at the people that have been the most critical. It's Wesley Witherspoon, who struggled in his career here, was you know, a, somewhat of a cancer to the team. And then you look at guys like Jaron Johnson or Chris Crawford, who for the most part bought into Josh Pastner during their time here, and they did fairly well. Um, Antonio Anderson spent one year under Josh, and I think his point was, you know, our, our, the team shouldn't be this way. It's not Josh's fault. Right. Um, and, and I get that. He was a part of the most successful run in Memphis <laughs> basketball history. I mean, I would feel the same way if that were the case. But, Eli, six years as the coach, and I, I sit, to you, sit next to you every day on radio, so I know how you feel about Josh and his style, and you don't feel a guy who is not more – Boisterous, maybe throwing out the expletives, doing can, can be that successful. No, I right? don't. I don't believe with this job and the type of athletes you get here, you the, a guy like Josh is going to be successful. Too nice. Um, I, you, and Josh, we've had the conversation. I've had the conversation with Josh. He refuses to say that you have to motivate through fear. I do believe with a lot of today's athletes, you have to be able to motivate through fear. And I just don't, if you're not willing to do it, I certainly don't think the Memphis job is for you. Would you agree, he's, Jason? He's, I, fear, I, I agree with Eli on that. I think it's either fear or respect. It's, 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 re, it's reverence. It's, it's, you, you wouldn't think about crossing this guy because you know that my basketball future might be in jeopardy. There's not that there. You don't, you don't sense that there with, with those players and with Josh. Grant, do they have respect and not fear, or do they have neither? I think there's a little bit of both, but I don't think there's enough level of that respect. You know, some guys will come out and defend him like Austin Nichols, who seems to do it on, on every opportunity. Um, but just thinking of, of – or just a way to look at it differently, uh, a guy like Justin Fuente, who, you know, I see on the practice field a lot, he has their respect. But at the same time, the minute they leave the field, he has his arm around him and he knows that they're – you know, he cares about him. And I don't think Josh has been able to find that proper relationship and just – it's a tough thing to do, and I, sure, but I think sure. that's the thing that determines whether or not you're a successful head coach. you got to be able to motivate your players, but at the same time, make them play hard for you. And Josh hadn't been able to do it. All right, question for all of you. Six years, Memphis Tigers program, the way it should be, what's legitimate? In the NCAA tournament, every six years you should what? Fill in the blank. Uh, I would say at least one, maybe two Sweet 16s. I Jason. would agree, especially with the way they've recruited here with, with Josh. Uh, at least one or two Sweet 16. At least one Sweet 16. I, I don't think that's out of the question. All right. The coaching changes, you think, you already said that there will be a change in your in your opinion. Do you think so? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm with Eli. I, I would think that you, you look at what happened last year and you say, okay, we got to change something. And, and the, the first one of the first things you look at is the staff. With the way Memphis has been – other way to put this, pinching pennies with the basketball program lately, you, you would wonder if maybe they're going to look at, okay, your two assistant coaches who are quote-unquote recruiters, both making 300000 Well, if you want to go out and get that former head coach, 
Keelan isn't going anywhere. So <laughs> which one of these? Would it be Robert Kirby? Would it be Aki Collins? Robert Kirby's, I believe, a family member of the Lawson's yeah. by marriage. Uh, so you might have the Lawson saying, well, it better not be Robert Kirby. Uh, but then again, what players does Robert Kirby have on that team right now? The, the, you know, the recruit, Dominic McGee is gone. Um, he's, hurt, he's helped with Nick Marshall, who they've got committed for 16. But you've got Aki, who's the one that's got the players in there for Aki and Josh, obviously. So it's if one of them's got to go, you, you figure it could be a puzzle on which one, which one you, you, you lose. Eli Savoy, Sports 56, thank you so much. Thank you. Jason Smith, of course, the beat writer, covers the Tigers for the commercial appeal. Thanks, Thanks for, for your time, me. as always. Grant, great to have you back, 24-7 Sports. Do Thanks, a terrific Grant. job following Memphis Tigers athletics. Thanks, guys, for the insight. Right. Appreciate you. it. And that'll do it for now. Remember, you can check out all of our previous Sports Files programs on our website by simply going to WKNO.org. Among our guests next Thursday, we'll catch up with the defending champion of the FedEx St. Jude Classic, Ben Crane. Until then, have a great week, and we'll see you next time. Production funding for Sports Files is made possible in part by... Infinity of Memphis has moved to Germantown Road just half mile north of Wolf Chase Galleria and is proud to support WKNO for its quality broadcasting and service to our community. Quality and service? No wonder Infinity of Memphis feels at home on WKNO.